Hello, I'm John Fisher, and this is A Tourist in Hawaii. When I was a kid, I loved to watch movies, and one of my favorite genres was disaster movies. I loved disaster movies because I didn't take any of it seriously. I just thought it looked like fun. Like people weren't really in danger, they were just having adventures, they were focused, they were trying to survive. Some of my favorite, oh, my favorite of all time, better than any others, was the Poseidon Adventure, that huge cruise ship bending over in that tidal wave, and everybody on New Year's Eve going to the side of the boat. And oh, I love the great San Francisco disaster movie, that towering inferno with William Holden being blown out windows by flames. <laughs> and, oh, and of course, the great California disaster movie, Earthquake. <laughs> Well, my problem was I just like to imitate these things. I like to play disaster movie. I didn't take them seriously. Everybody just looked like they were focused and having fun and on adventures. And a great subgenre for me, one that I loved immensely was volcano movies. I used to love to imagine that a huge volcano was exploding behind me and lava was flowing towards me. And I was running, running, running from lava. Oh my God. So let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, you at home and me. Let's run from some lava. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this will be easy. It's really easy. All you do is run and scream. Ah, yeah. You can do it at home. You can stand up. You can do it at your dinner table. You can even do it in bed. Just move your arms. Sitting position, anything. So let's run from some lava, okay? Here we go. Okay, start running. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The huge volcano has exploded. The lava's coming. Scream, scream. Ah! Yeah, I can hear you. I got that's great, good, I can hear you. Good screams, good screams. Good, good group, good group. Run, run, run for the walking. Oh my God, the lava's coming. It's gaining on us. The lava's gaining on us. It's gonna cook us like French toast. Oh my God. Scream, scream. Yeah, yeah, keep up the screaming. Good group, good group. Ah, 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 ah. That was great. Good group. I could really feel that. You were all out there supporting each other. This real community of, of, of lava screamers. Good work. That was inspiring, fun, good group, terrific. But you see, that was the problem. I could never take any of it seriously. I just thought disasters were fun. At the beginning of this year, back in uh, January, I've been doing play after play after play. I've been too busy. And my husband, Michael, was busy at work all the time. And we hadn't had any time together. So we decided we had to take a vacation spontaneously. We're just gonna take off. And in early February, we started looking around for someplace to go, but I knew where I wanted to go. And I convinced Michael, the big island of Hawaii. Why? Because they had beaches, it was hot. There was great hiking, great weather. And there was a volcano, a real volcano oozing lava into the ocean. I want to get back to the volcano. You know, we've been there a few years before. I left it, left it, left it. So, I convinced Michael, let's go to the big island and he wanted to go too. So we went on kayak, you know, kayak, that search engine for finding cheapo stuff, condos and flights and cars. So we started doing the kayak thing on our computers, Expedia, Travelocity, all those things. Do it with me, do it with me. Kayak clicking, clicking. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I can hear you guys know what kayak is, great, good, good. But we're looking at our screens and there was nothing available. So beginning of February, everything was booked. Everything was taken. We'd waited too long. There's nothing cheap available. It was only super fancy stuff, really expensive. We blew it. But then 10 years later, 10, 10 days later, things started becoming available. They started freeing up. See it. it was mid-February and stuff was freeing up. Do the clicking. And, the, and it looked like we were gonna book a room and a car and a flight. It was great, I was excited. So I left that part of it to Michael to finalize. And now I was confident. I was gonna get my vacation on the big island at the end of February. Yay! So I went down to my favorite place in San Francisco. I went down to the Embarcadero Y. Now confident that I was gonna get my vacation. I went down to the Y because I took to go every day and I had to swim and dive into the pool and swim laps. Yes, off to Hawaii, I was sure of it. And then I went up to the weight room. Now, I want you to recreate the weight room for me. Yeah, okay. So here's some machines you can do. Yeah, you can do this machine. This is really good for the chest. Try doing this. Yeah, it builds up your chest. Get a big, firm chest. 
<laughs> or the ab machine like this. This is good for your tummy. Flattens your tummy. Really good for the tummy. Or you can do the pull-ups like this. Yeah, you get pretty arms doing this. Really pretty arms. Yeah, so do one of those machines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Create the room for me. Yeah. Great, great, you're doing it. Good, 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 good. Mm, good group. Mm, fun, 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 fun. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah. So I went over to my favorite. You keep going, keep going. Keep going. I wanna, I wanna feel like I'm in the room. Yeah. So I went over to my favorite machine, which is the treadmill. And I set it on six miles an hour and I started running on the treadmill. And I'm looking out the windows of the Embarcadero Y, those spectacular windows with that incredible view. And I'm looking at the Bay Bridge and all the boats in the harbor. And the thing I love about the treadmill is you can look down and there's a screen and it's got the news on it. So I would jog on the treadmill and read the BBC News. But the news wasn't good news. It was terrible news. It's all about coronavirus. It was in Hubei, in Wuhan specifically. It was in Japan. There were even a few cases in Europe. I mean, it wasn't in Africa, it wasn't in the United States. Was it spreading? Was it coming this way? I didn't know how serious this was. Interesting. And then there were jokey things about it. Like in the United States, people had stopped buying Corona beer. They thought that would prevent them from getting coronavirus. Weird. So I got off the machine. That was great. I really saw those machines you got. I even saw some machines I hadn't seen before. Smart people, clever, clever. I got the, off the treadmill and I was looking at my phone and there was a text from Michael, my husband. He booked us a condo and a flight and a car cheap. The times were even perfect. It was great. I was so excited. I was going to Hawaii, to that big island. I was going to see the volcanoes. Yay! So on Sunday, my play closed. And on Monday morning, we went to the airport to get our flight. Michael had gotten us great seats on the plane. And you know, usually at the airport, it's like everything's crammed, everything's sold out now. I mean, when you go down the jetway, it's like you have to like crowd down the jetway. And then when you go to the plane, you have to like move sideways all the time, get into your seat. But that wasn't the case this time. There weren't that many people at the airport. And when I was heading down the jetway, it was easy. You know, I just sort of like sauntered down the jetway, hey, no problem. There weren't that many people. And I got to my seat. And there was an empty seat between us. The plane was half full. It was strange. There was something like laying down in three seats across the aisle from me. I haven't seen that in 20 years. The, uh, the stewardess brought me my headset and I was ready to take off. So let's do the takeoff. Let's do the takeoff. Yeah, help me with the takeoff. So you're going to start with a low rumble jet engine. Now that I'm all buckled in. It's like this. And as I go like this, the jet engine's going to get louder and louder as that plane takes off for the big island. Okay, here we go. Get louder, get louder. That's it, good, good, good. I was airborne over San Francisco, headed to Hawaii in this wonderful plane that wasn't crowded. The stewardess gave me things. I relaxed. I had leg room. It was great. I was so excited. And then the plane landed at the big island. It was kind of rough landing. Give me a rough landing. The airport in the middle of a lot of people. I was there. I was at the big island. And I put on my synthetic lay. Yeah. And I had my sunglasses and I got off the plane. But the airport was weird. It wasn't crowded like it usually is. There weren't that many people at the airport. But I still ran for the uh, for the rental car bus. You know those little buses. I ran to be the first one on it, so I didn't have to wait in line. Run with me. Run for the run for the rental car bus. Yeah, run, run, run. And I got on the bus. There was hardly anybody on it. And when the bus pulled into the rental car agency, I got off and I ran to beat everybody in the line. But there was no line. I went right up to the guy. He was standing there, and I I thought, well, this is weird. Nobody was in Hawaii, very few people, very few tourists. And I thought he'd say something about it, but he didn't. He said, oh, I like your watches. You guys collect watches like me. I get these off of eBay. I thought, well, that's weird. He didn't say anything about it. And he gave us an upgrade because they had extra cars. Weird. But I was excited. 
I was on the big island, hiking, beaches, great weather, and those volcanoes. So we went to our condo. It was lovely, right on the golf course. Yes, and it had turkeys. I didn't know there were turkeys in Hawaii. Turkeys in our backyard. We'd sit out there and look at the turkeys. So on our first day, we were very excited because we were going to go on our first big adventure, a place we always wanted to go to. So we got up early in the morning and I drove on this windy little road through these beautiful farms all the way across the island. And I took a left turn and I turned right into the parking lot and we got out of the car and there we were at the overlook of Waipio Valley. Amazing, this incredible valley, sacred valley stretching out before us emerald green in the morning sunshine, all that foliage swaying in the breeze below us, getting the sound. <sighs> Spectacular. And we headed down, down, down into the valley, hiking down, down into White Peel Valley. Hike down with me. Down, 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 down. All the way to the bottom of the valley. And there we were. And the only sound down there was the crashing of the surf on the Whitefield Beach. It was so loud. The valley worked like a megaphone to amplify the sound. Do it for me. Do the motion through that house. Good, good, yeah, yeah, good, good. And you can also do the sucking sound when it goes out. Great, great, we got some great crashers here and some great suckers. Good group, wonderful. So Michael and I were walking across the beach, looking out at that thunderous surf. You would never go near this stuff. It was lethal, it was like an animal. It would grab you and suck you out and chew you up. We didn't want to go in the water. We wanted to hike and we're going to the sand. And then we got to this river and we took our shoes off and our phones and wallets out. We held them up our head and we were waist deep in water and the rocks were slippery. It was very hard to get across this river. It was a real challenge. It was an adventure. Wipe We got to the other side and we put on our shoes, put our phones and wallets away, and we headed up this trail, a huge switchback trail that went up the other side of the valley to a great lookout spot. We're hiking up this switchback trail, but there was nobody with us. Usually when we went on these hikes, there were people all over the place. We're always passing people saying hi. In years past, that always happened, but not now. There were very few people there. We had the island all to ourselves, pretty much. And we got to this little overlook with palm trees swaying over our heads, and we looked back into the Waipio Valley. Stunning, emerald green, stretching forever in the sunlight, taro fields below, and then like shoestrings, like little strips of silver, waterfalls falling a thousand feet, three of them into the valley. It was spectacular. And below us, we could hear the surf crashing. And it was incredible. We looked out to the ocean, beautiful blue, this stunning valley. What a gift. But then I remembered that this actually was the site of a major disaster, although no movie was ever made about it. In 1946, a massive tsunami hit Waipio Valley and thundered into the valley. And because the valley was shaped like a megaphone, it focused the energy of the tsunami and it raced all the way up to the valley and then it sucked everything out of the valley, wiped it clean. The valley was destroyed. A sacred spot, sacred to the ancient Hawaiians, to the contemporary Hawaiians, to everybody, destroyed by disaster. Not a film, the real thing. And I looked down thinking, wow, it still hadn't recovered. It was still being rebuilt in 1946. The next day we planned a hike to my favorite spot, the volcano. But Michael looked at his app and he said, well, we can't go to the volcano. I said, why not? We'd been there a few years before. We hiked out in the middle of the night across the lava field. It was so hard to move, but so exciting, leaping over the lava. And then we got to a spot and we looked back and there was lava pouring into the ocean. <laughs> Send up steam, <laughs> do some steam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good, good steam. <laughs> good steam. <laughs> it was wonderful to really see lava. It was so far away, it was safe. It was incredible. But in 2018, the lava wasn't safe. That particular run, that river of lava dried up 
Pu'u, it was called. And another one burst in the middle of a suburb in Puna, a surprise river of lava flowing through a suburb, destroying houses. People were really running for their lives as the river of lava flowed to the sea. Massive destruction. And Michael said the park's closed. You can't go up there. You can go to very little of the park because they don't know where it's going to appear again. The disaster could be anywhere. So we, uh, we changed our plans. We wanted to go to our favorite bay in the big island, Ke'alakakua Bay, that's wonderful bay at the bottom of a huge lava flow. We always had gone there before and we wanted to go again because it was such an exciting trip down into the bay. But as it turned out, that was also the site of the disaster, a real one. So we got up early, we parked our car at the head of the trail, and we hiked down, 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 hiked with me down, 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 into Ke'alakakua Bay, down, 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 all the way down to the bay. And there we were, and when we got to the bay, we put on our swimsuits and our goggles, and we dove into the water, and we started to swim with our goggles, and we were looking down, swim with me. Swim with me at Ke'alakakua Bay. Yeah, that's right, good. You don't have to make any noise, it's regular really noise in the water, so. Yeah, like um, yeah. And we're looking at the fishies, all the beautiful little fishies, yellow fishies and big schools, striped fishies, neon fishies. It was wonderful, just us and the fishies. And we turned our heads to the left, we surfaced a little bit, and there, towering over our heads, was a huge white obelisk, a tribute to Captain Cook would come to Alakakua Bay in 1779. And that was the great meeting of the two great cultures, the Hawaiian culture and the British cultures brought together in Alakakua Bay, where we had gone down, 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 down. But uh, Cook didn't just bring metal, which was prized and which the Hawaiians wanted. He didn't just bring his glorious ships, which were so impressive to the Hawaiians. He didn't just have his men with him. He also brought something else in 1779. He brought disease, venereal disease. Watch the islands in 1779. The year before, Cook had arrived with his ship, but he didn't go to the big island. He went to Kauai. He didn't want his men to go ashore because he knew what would happen, but it was prevailed on him to give his men shore leave. So let them go ashore. They were ashore two nights. And when he returned, in 1779, he saw what those two nights had done. The narrow disease had run rampant amongst the Hawaiians in just a year. That's what Cook had brought to Hawaii, the narrow disease, a disease from the West arriving on a ship. And as we looked at our app, reading about Hawaii, we saw that cruise ships were being turned back, were not being allowed to off board were being quarantined because cruise ships were bringing coronavirus to the island. The same thing that happened in 1779, disease delivered to Hawaii on ships. At Te'arakakua Bay, Cook also met Kamehameha, Kamehameha, that chief, one of the big chiefs on the big island. And he would eventually become Kamehameha the Great, Kamehameha the Conqueror. And Kamehameha saw something on Cook's ships that he wanted. He saw cannons. And he traded. He got cannons. And why did he want cannons? Because he wanted to take over the Hawaiian Islands. He wanted to rule Hawaii. He wanted to bring it all together as one nation, one empire, and rule it as Kamehameha the Great. And he almost succeeded immediately because with the cannons, the cannons he got from Cook, he got the rest of the big island there. He then moved on to Maui, Molokai, Oahu, and the only thing that was holding out was Kauai. So he assembled a massive army, the army of Kamehameha the Great, and he put it on his massive fleet, and the fleet was going to sail for Kauai and demolish the Kauai chief's army. But before it could, cholera struck. Another disease brought, this time by an American ship in 1804. Kamehameha's army was devastated, brought low by cholera. Everybody was sick. It was a devastating tragedy for him on the brink of unifying the islands and his army was laid low. On the other side of Alakakua Bay is a huge haiau, 
Michael and I loved highways. We discovered them in Maui a few years before, these massive ceremonial structures made of stone, huge key central to the Hawaiian religion. And Kamehameha, the, the, the great, was so, he was so frantic about how to solve the problem of the disease that was destroying his people that he sacrificed humans at the Hayao in Honolulu. Well, eventually the cholera passed and Kamehameha was able to conquer the Hawaiian Islands to rule them as Kamehameha the Great. And then in the early 1800s, other people started arriving in Hawaii. The whalers, the whaling fleet came from America. There were whales aplenty in Hawaii in all the channels. Whales, you can still see them today. People go out on tour boats, you can see them from the freeway. Here, here, do, do, do some whales for me, do some whale spots. Psh, spots and waters of whale. Psh, psh. Yeah, that's good. They're not really big. No, 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 they're not really big. They can be small. Psh, psh. They can be medium. Psh, psh. Everybody do a spout. Psh. Yeah, good group, good group, terrific. And also, in the early 1800s came missionaries. And the missionaries came all the way from New England. So it took them six months to come around the southern tip of South America. They had to go to the Straits of Magellan, these poor missionaries. They had to tack back and forth through the Straits of Magellan, through stormy seas, through ice, give me some big waves. <laughs> Show me some icebergs. Yeah, keep it coming, make it hard. And the missionaries tacked back and forth through the Straits of Magellan, taking six months getting to Hawaii. And finally they arrived in Lahaina and Honolulu. But the missionaries didn't just bring religion, and the whalers didn't just bring business to Hawaii. In 1820, when the missionaries arrived, they also brought disease. The whaling fleet brought more venereal disease. The missionaries brought influenza, measles, fatal because the Hawaiians had no natural immunity. They brought typhoid, they brought smallpox. And there were hikes as we read about all this. We also read that coronavirus was coming to the island. And somehow people had gotten off those ships, those cruise ships. And we saw very few people around us. Not only we'd see lots of people, tons of people on our hikes. And, and we began to see that our flight might be canceled. The United was canceling flights all over the place because they weren't making any money because nobody was flying. And we thought we might have our flight canceled. We might not ever get back. Kamehameha the Great had unified the islands and passed, and he was succeeded by Kamehameha II. And Kamehameha II set out on a massive tour of the world. He wanted to spread the good word of Hawaii. He wanted to show the world how great Hawaii was. So he and his queen toured every European capital and their regalia, all those beautiful yellow feathers and those big helmets and their retinue. But in 1824, they arrived in London. They both contracted measles. In 1824, Kamehameha II and his wife both died. Died of measles in London. He was succeeded by Kamehameha III. Now, Kamehameha III was, he was freaked out. His population was, was withering away. He was being destroyed, decimated by diseases that kept arriving, kept arriving. Kings were being lost now by diseases overseas. He had to do something. He had to increase his population. And during the 19th century, a million dollars would be spent by the Hawaiian kings to encourage people to immigrate to Hawaii, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Portuguese. Unfortunately, in 1848, whooping cough arrived. The measles came to the island. 1848. It hit the same populations that are being affected by coronavirus, the same populations that are targeted. It also hit children. Nine out of 10 children in some communities died from these diseases. And the problem was that people could get to Hawaii now too quick in 1848. Back when the missionaries had come, they had to go all the way around the bottom of South America through the Straits of Magellan. <laughs> 
Well, it took them six months. And as they were coming, they could get sick from their diseases and they could die from their diseases or they could recover such that when they arrived at the islands finally, the diseases were not as potent. But now disease could be delivered in 1848 to the Hawaiian Islands in two weeks. Boom! Why? Because of San Francisco. In 1848, San Francisco took off and suddenly it was two weeks away and ships came from San Francisco and they were bringing disease with them. And I thought, as I looked at our app and read the news, had I thoughtlessly myself, a tourist from San Francisco brought something with me, unknowing, unaware? In 1848, 30,000 people succumbed, were struck down by these diseases. Kamehameha III was, he was freaked out. He didn't know what to do. So he created the Board of Health and gave it dictatorial powers in 1850 to solve this problem. The diseases had to be stopped. It was the first Board of Health in any of the territories that would eventually become the United States. And it was strong, but it wasn't strong enough because in 1853, An American ship called the Charles Mallory brought smallpox to Hawaii once again. The sailors were quarantined. They knew they had smallpox, but other ships kept coming from San Francisco, and those sailors were not quarantined. The Board of Health didn't know what to do, and sailors spread out across the islands, and they spread their disease. The ships kept arriving. The disease kept spreading. Eventually, 6,000 died, mostly Hawaiians, native Hawaiians of this disease. And the markets were bare because there was a panic, and people rushed to the markets, and they bought everything, and the shelves were bare. And I thought about this. In the first week of sheltering place, when Michael and I, we went to Whole Foods, we went to Lucky, we went to the corner store, and there was nothing. In Hawaii, there wasn't enough food, and people who starve are vulnerable to disease, and they were laid low, flattened by this disease. In the Honolulu Hospital, 1,000 people in that hospital alone died. There wasn't enough room to bury them. They had to bury them like books on a shelf, sideways, to make enough room. In 1865, leprosy struck. Nobody knew where it came from. Wait, you what brought it? Racist white residents of Hawaii said it was the Chinese disease. They had to blame somebody. It must have come from China. They blamed the Chinese. The racist white missionaries said, no, 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 it's Hawaiians who are getting it. They're promiscuous. It must be a kind of BD. It was all judgments. It was trying to demonize people, blame them for this disease that nobody knew where it came from. Nobody knew what to do. It was panic. So what the government done was it loaded everybody who was living with leprosy, who had leprosy, and sent them on a schooner called the Warwick to Kalopapa, a peninsula off the island of Molokai. They were dragged onto the ships, forced against their will to go to Molokai to die. And then they were dumped off the ships. They had to wander ashore through the surf. Nobody was sent to take care of them. A few years ago, Michael and I wanted to go to Kailupapa, but we couldn't just go. It wasn't like the other places. You had to get permission from the national parks because there were still people living with leprosy at Kailupapa. We got our permission and we hiked down, 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 down to Kailupapa, down, 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 all the way down to the peninsula. And there our tour guide met us and showed us all around this amazing peninsula. And this wasn't a disaster that had come and gone because there were still people living down there who had leprosy, but they were living there by choice. They had not been dragged there. The disaster remained. And we went out to the edge of the peninsula and we looked back at Molokai, the most spectacular view in all of Hawaii. I've never seen anything like this. Those huge sea crabs soaring up into the sky, covered with this foliage blowing in the wind, cobalt blue ocean, the most adorable little islands you've ever seen. This view was spectacular from this notorious peninsula. The exiles kept coming, 1865, 1866. 1867, throughout the 1870s, thousands and thousands of other people who didn't have the disease came to take care of them. They sacrificed their lives to take care of the people living with leprosy at Fellow Papa. Father Damien, a Belgian priest, young man, went to Kalu Papa to tend the sick. He too contracted leprosy and succumbed in 1889. 
and was eventually made a saint. And Saint Marian came from France to attend the people living with leprosy. She too became a saint, a nun. In 1899, bubonic plague struck. It was brought by rat fleas on the ship Nippon Maru, and it first appeared in Chinatown. Many people living in Chinatown had the disease, so of course the racist whites of the Hawaiian population said that it was the China virus, the Chinese disease. Somebody had to be blamed, again, scapegoating. And I thought of this in the first week of Shelter in Place when our president referred to it as the China virus. Always somebody has to be blamed, scapegoating. What does it achieve? The Board of Health went into action with their dictatorial powers. They determined that they had to light sanitary fires wherever the disease was found. They had to burn down houses. So people were taken out of the houses and a quarantine was put on them. They were put outside Chinatown and then certain houses were lit on fire to destroy them, to destroy the disease, but the, the Board of Health couldn't control the fire. The sparks fled, the fire leapt across streets and Chinatown burned out of control. The Board of Health dictatorial powers, but they couldn't control the fire. It destroyed Chinatown, 38 acres flattened by flame. The fire only went out when it reached the water and people who'd been quarantined rushed back to get their belongings, but they were held back, they couldn't get in. So everybody lost their belongings and Chinatown burned to the ground. And there was a sinister aspect of all this because when Chinatown was rebuilt, it was rebuilt mostly with white businesses. The white businesses moved in and the Chinese businesses had to move further out. A direct result of the fires set to destroy the bubonic plague. And more and more, we were reading our apps and talking to people and a dire pall had fallen over Hawaii. Coronavirus was everywhere in the United States. It was popping up all over the place and it had also come to Hawaii and everybody knew it. On the last day of our trip, we had tickets. We bought them weeks before to go see a musical at this community theater I'd always wanted to go to, the Aloha Theater. It was located right above Kealakakua Bay, where it all began with Cook and Kamehameha in this wonderful community theater. And we thought, well, why not? Let's just go see the show. And we were gonna leave the next day and we wanted to have something fun to do. So we didn't really think about it. We just said, well, we have the tickets, let's go which is astonishing to me now because of course nobody was talking about social distancing that hadn't started up yet. Masks, gloves, but it didn't make sense to go see a play. Anyway, we went and the theater was packed. It was the final performance. We arrived and we were caught in a jam in the lobby and there was a jam to get into the bathroom. It just didn't get to our seats. We had to squirm, squirm. The theater was sold out. It was the final performance and we were jammed in this theater. It's a horrifying experience. And I sat there thinking, my God, what are we doing? This is madness. And then the artistic director, he stepped through the curtain. He walked towards the audience and he said, thank you, thank you so much for coming uh, to our final performance. This has been a great production to work on. It's so nice to have you here celebrating with us, closing performance. I just wanted to say something. Um, after the show, I know a lot of you know members of the cast. And if you'd like to say hello, they'll be backstage, but please don't hug. Okay, please don't hug them. And don't be offended if they don't hug you. Uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know why. And um, please don't hug them. Please don't be offended if they don't hug you. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. And I sat there thinking, what a weird disconnect. Here I am packed in this theater and he's talking about not hugging actors after the show, please. But I wasn't appreciative. I didn't think that till that moment. It was too late. The world was rushing forward and we were stumbling to catch up. We were just realizing what was happening and we were all packed like sardines in that theater. We've been worried the whole time that we wouldn't get away, that they cancel our flight. We came out of the theater, we opened up our apps and oh, it said you can check in. So we checked in immediately. And the next morning we got up early and we raced to the airport because we thought that flight would be canceled. We wanted to get there, we wanted to get there. And when we got to the airport, the airport was full. It was thronged with people. I was like, where did they all come from? There hadn't been anybody here when we arrived. Nobody. 
And we had to go through more security than I've ever had to go through. We were checked and questioned and investigated and asked all sorts of, of questions about everything. And finally, we got through everything, the sweeps, the swipes, the examinations, and we were headed out onto the tarmac. And we came up the stairs in the plane, the old-fashioned way, and the plane was packed like sardines. I didn't know you could get this many people on a plane. I knew I had a certain number of seats, but it seemed like it was more full. And I could just barely get to my seat, barely squeezing between people and luggage. And I sat down on this packed plane and back to San Francisco. And I realized that United had put everybody for all the canceled flights all week on this plane. And probably people for other airlines were all going home. And the plane took off. It wasn't exciting this time. It was foreboding. We sat there, nobody was wearing gloves, nobody was wearing masks, we're all crammed together. People were coughing, people were sneezing. They served us our food, we ate it barehanded. And if you had to go to the bathroom, you squeezed between people, and then you squeezed down the aisle, and you squeezed into the bathroom. And I sat there on this tight, tight plane, and I thought again, my God, the world is racing ahead of us. And nobody said anything. The pilot didn't say anything. The, the stewardesses didn't say anything. And I thought, this is panic. This is calm panic. Everybody just wants to get home. They just want to escape. And we did get home. We returned to San Francisco. I thought, oh my God, I might have caught it. I might have caught it on that plane or in that crowded theater. And then I thought, and maybe I took something with me. Maybe I didn't catch something. Maybe I took something there with me thoughtlessly. Maybe like Captain Cook and the whalers and the missionaries, and so many other people from San Francisco, I had delivered something to the Hawaiian Islands thoughtlessly. I mean, I didn't know. I just went on vacation. I, I had no idea. Nobody was talking about it. You weren't allowed. You weren't told you couldn't travel. You weren't, you weren't cautioned not to go anywhere. But people have been canceling flights. Didn't I understand that? Didn't that make sense to me? And I realized that maybe I wasn't just a victim. Maybe I was a perpetrator. Maybe I'd taken something to this magical place that I love so much. Maybe I delivered another disaster, a real one, to paradise. Thank you. Wow, John, what a piece. How did you develop that so quickly? Did you know about all these disasters going in? Uh, no, I, I just have all these books I used to buy when we went there that I never read. And so when we finally got back and uh, I was sheltering in place, I just started reading my books finally. And I was like, geez, this place is like cursed. And um, yeah, it, was, it came from books I did after I got back. Wow. Wow. One thing after another. Yeah. That was incredible. Yeah. Whoa, you know? The give and take or the kill and kill, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the most beautiful place on earth and also just disaster after disaster. Yeah, it's, it's sad, but spectacular. Yeah. So um, what were some of the good things that happened while you were there? Oh, I mean, that was what was so weird about it. We kept doing these wonderful things and then we'd look at the news and then we'd do something wonderful and we'd look at the news. And we do something, and it's just like, it was like, you know, and it sort of all sort of folded together, the news and what we read in the guidebook about the disasters and we read online. I was like, God, I mean, the world is cursed and this is cursed central. I mean, so much, so much has been delivered there. And, and yet everybody there is wonderful. 
it, you know, there, it's the most, it's the most wonderful state in the union. And, um, but we did, we did great things. I mean, all those things we did, I, I, I loved. And uh, I even loved the musical, right? But, you know, at intermission, I'm like, uh, this doesn't feel right. And I think I ever was thinking that, but it's like mass hysteria. It's like, well, we paid for the tickets. The tickets are bought, you know, I want a cookie. You know, you're just sort of stuck in a mode. And I think fortunately now we're coming out of it, but it was like, let's go out and have fun mode. That's a hard thing, I think, for Americans to let go. Yeah. So when you came home, you know, did you quarantine yourself? What, what, was, what happened when you got back here? Well, I started doing a play at the Marsh. And, <laughs> um, and then finally, fortunately, the government told us to stop because, you know, you and me, we would have gone on forever, right? I mean, I just feel like the, the show must go on mentality. It was like it was getting me in trouble. And uh, so, you know, uh, suddenly the show was canceled and uh, I sheltered in place. And, you know, Michael and I have just been here the whole time. Wow. Wow. What a piece. What a spectacular piece. Can you see some of the chats? And, you know, everyone here, if you have some questions, if you want to put them in the chat, we can ask John. Um, yeah, by all means. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're both artistic directors of theater, me for the Marsh, you of Theater Rhinoceros. What's it feeling like for you during this time and, and the pivot? Um, well, in a way, uh, you're an inspiration because you are just like crazy producing on Zoom. And we've been producing two or three shows a week, but we can't keep up with you. <laughs> and, but I think we have the same, I mean, it's like, I'm sort of like, what can we do? I don't, I, you know, I want to, you know, I like to, I like to perform and I, I, I want our audience to feel like even though they can't come to a theater, they can come someplace. And, um, and I, and, and again, that's why I love it. I was like, every day I get your emails. And it's like, bingo. I'm like, that's great. I mean, you know, it's just like, and so um, I've been working very hard. I mean, uh, shelter in place for me has been a lot of hard work, but that's good. It's kept me from thinking too much about stuff. I mean, I, I do think, but you know, it's like, it's like, and then I have to get back to work and, then, and fundraising. I mean, all these things have to keep happening to keep the theaters going. I don't know when we're gonna be able to go back into theaters. So we'll do it online. Yeah, yep. So what are you doing online for the at Theater I right now? Right now? Uh, uh, I do a one man show every week. So this um, was one of those shows and I just do a one man show that I, the whole thing is developed and rehearsed and put together in a week. From the original idea, which I have on Friday to the performance on Thursday. So every Thursday I have a one-man show. Joe Talley and I put on a reading series of LGBT plays. And, um, and one of them was actually fully staged and memorized, but uh, most of them are reading series plays. And um, he also does other things that are not part of that program. We have a reading series, we have a Saturday night series. And so it usually works out to being two or three shows a week. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's great because, you know, working with actors is different from doing your, your solo show. And I just, we just did a show the other night. I was like, oh, this is great. I feel like I'm back in rehearsal. And, you know, I got everybody in a little box, but, uh, you know, they just show up and we rehearse and they go home. You know, it's exciting. I mean, it's not, a, it, it's exciting, but wrong. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. it's, is it really wrong or is it just another offshoot of what we're doing because I know I would never imagine I, I would do this we collaborated with a, a LGBT theater company in Ireland two of the actors were in Ireland and one was here and the director was here and we couldn't have done that before we had did a live performance and they got up at 3 a.m so that we could do an eight o'clock show and they were great on these these beautiful Irish accents coming out of Ireland Right, and one of them was here. He was he's our intern, and he just happens to be here. So it's like some wonderful things have happened, really incredible stuff I would never thought possible. So what? How do you see this whole thing, and how is it going to play out for Theater Rhino? You know, how are you feeling about it financially and creatively? Uh, financially, it's a catastrophe. It's it's awful, but. You know, we, we, keep, we have a lot of support and our funders have been, you know, uh, some of them have been very supportive. Our uh, donors have been supportive. Creatively, Joe and I are just like, won't say die. 
we're just like, no, we're going to put on shows. You know, we're putting on more shows than we ever did. No, they're just going to put on shows. Zoom is easy. I mean, it's not easy, but it's like you can get people together. And they don't need to spend an hour and a half getting to rehearsal. And, you know, you don't have to have a break so they can all go to dinner. I mean, you just rehearse for a couple hours and then people sign off. And so we're trying to exploit, we're trying to work within the limitations. And it's actually been great. I mean, our first Zoom thing was like pretty sloppy, but we're figuring it out. And um and having fun with it. We just did a farce on Zoom called Zoom Catastrophe. It was everything that could go wrong with a Zoom meeting, a high-powered Zoom meeting. And it was fun, you know, because now everybody knows about Zoom. So I don't know. We'll see where we end up, right? That's for sure. Let's see. Do we have any uh, any questions? Can we... Brian, our manager, have you seen anything? Yeah, I've got a question here. John, what date did you leave Hawaii? Um, it was the Monday morning uh, before shelter in place. So it was exactly a week before shelter in place. So whatever, shelter in place was midnight of a Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and it was the week before that. So, and I have a question, um, you're live on YouTube. So we've got uh, some folks watching you live on YouTube. I've got a question from YouTube of uh, what have you been doing during this time to keep yourself busy other than performing? Uh, well, uh, we take bike rides. Michael and I go on big bike rides. We have a project to go to the top of every hill in San Francisco on our bikes. So um, we found a blog that lists 51 hills. Who knew, you know? So we go on these bike rides and we ride to the top of the hill. And sometimes we can't even get up from there so steep, but we, we push the bikes up there and we discovered all these parks. Every single hill in San Francisco has a park at the top of it. And it's sort of amazing. And so we go to these new neighborhoods and it's been great. And uh, I read to Michael, I read short stories to him aloud. And um, we watch some things, we've watched some, some good stuff, um, but uh, it's kind of, fun to hang out with your husband all the time. I'll say that, uh, right? Um, so I really enjoyed that. And we, you know, we go on to bed. Oh, I swim in, at Aquatic Park, um, at, at, you know, the Dolphin Club. I would never have done that before. I mean, I, I'm terrified of like uh, uh, sea lions. I think they're gonna bite me. And, um, but I, I started swimming at Aquatic Park because my gym is shut. And so I go in that water and now it, it, it's like horrifyingly cold. It's like so cold, but I just dive in and I like almost have a heart attack every time I dive in. But then the, the heart, what's scary is you get used to it. And, um, and then you surface and you're laying on your back and you've got the best view ever because it's like Ghirardelli and the bridge. And so that's been great. And Michael plays lifeguard. He makes sure I don't drown. He sits there and eats. And if, he's, if, if anything goes wrong with me, he'll dive in and say that. Well, will you, do you think you'll continue this when once your gym opens? No, I want to swim in a real pool. I don't want to swim in. Yeah, it's too cold. It's like 52 degrees. It's incredible. But it's it's fun. And everybody there is like really cool because they're like, you know, they're like me. It's like, this is this this is what we got. It's like, you know, what do you got? You know, what's left? You know? So... So if we're taking, John, these things that you put forth in, in the play tonight about responsibility and disease and things like that, is there some, some things we can take for that, from that which is going on now? I mean, you know, things are opening up. There's more disease happening uh, where the things are open up. Peter, people are talking about their independent freedoms and that they don't want them taken away. What what would you say about all this? Well, I think a, a democracy makes you be the dictator of your life. You don't have a dictator. You don't have a king. But you got to be, I mean, you got to be responsible. And you got to realize that you might want to do something, but if it's hurting somebody else or could potentially, you probably shouldn't do it. And all this stuff opening up makes me kind of nervous. Of course, as somebody who runs a theater, I want the theaters to open up. But I'm also sort of like, why are we doing this? Are we doing this because it's safe or because there's pressure on the government? And I just think we need to be cautious. I've never been through anything like this. And it just seems, you know, I'm, I'm usually like, oh, let's just put on a show. Let's do this, let's do that. But now I'm sort of like the opposite of what I've always been, which is like, I, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna do that. I go outside and wear my mask. And I, I really try to stay away from people. And it's not like, it's not like, don't give me your disease. It's like, I might have it. You know, it's just, 
I think I think we've got to be very, very careful. And apparently San Francisco's done pretty well, but I see things every day. I'm like, oh really? Wow. There's a big group of people and they're all together. And I don't imagine they're all living in one house. So I don't know, it's weird. Uh, I think we have to take the conservative approach. That's at least what I'm doing. So how, how in the long run do you think it's gonna affect Theater Rhino? I don't know, it's, um, fortunately we've got a lot of support. So we're not shutting down and Joe and I are still at work and um, you know, we still have jobs. And um, I think uh, when things start up again, we're already talking to a supervisor about doing a play outdoors in Dolores Park. And they were very enthusiastic, but I don't know what that's gonna be. I don't know if it's gonna be like a social distance play. I imagine it will be where the actors can't get close to each other. I don't know how we're gonna rehearse it. We're very eager to get started again, but I don't want to do it too soon, right? How about the marsh? What are you thinking about the marsh? Well, we're, we, we, we're loving, and when, we're really loving the marsh stream. We are really yeah. loving. It's yeah. just like what you said, one day we did the Monday Night Marsh and this guy was playing a Scottish Celtic fiddle and he sounded Scottish and we're like, ooh, you know, like, I'm like, when did you move here? He said, <laughs> he said, I'm from Scotland. And I said, I'm in Scotland right now. It's like, what, four yeah, o'clock right. in the morning, right? And I'm like, really? He said, yeah. I'm like, how did you find out about the marsh? He's like, oh, we, you know, I was a friend of mine in San Diego. I was there last year, told me that it was the best place to develop solo work. And I was like, whoa, you know, and then you start to find these things so that on one hand, we, I like this ability and it's so, you know, supportive and people are so supportive of it. And I love that this whole audience is here and I see the Marstons and I see Steve and I see all these people I know. It's like, I wouldn't see these people probably in the theater is not as many. But on the other hand, then we're saying, well, when are we going to be able to open? How yeah. will we be able to open? I mean, are we going to, you know, right now they're talking about summer camps. Like we do summer camps. It's like, well, you can do summer camps but you have can only have 12 kids. They have to have two teachers. It has to be three weeks and you can't mix the kids up. So if some of the kids don't come, it's not like you can add anymore. It's gotta be the same thing. And how do you run these camps with 12 kids and all that? But, you know, we're we can't wait to get back in the theater as well. We wanna be able to incorporate both, all these aspects of it, you know, like support this kind of, digital stuff, support, you know, continue all these shows that we were supposed to do that aren't happening. Your show getting canceled. Yeah. Laser, yeah. you know, all these new shows that we were doing. How do we support them? And, and it's, I, you know, it's like making that transition to a do, Zoom show is, is not automatic. You know, it's not, you can't just do what you did before. No, it's totally different. It's, um, I feel like, I mean, out of the shot, I've got all this stuff. I feel like it's filmmaking. There's like all this stuff, but all you see is like what I control, which is, it's, 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 I mean, it's like a making movie, I guess. I mean, which is very different feel from, of course, being in front of an audience. The audiences are magical. This has made me believe so much in live theater. Um, you know, just the sound of an audience is, uh, even when they're not making a sound. Um, you know, I even miss the people getting up to go to the bathroom or coffee. You know? <laughs> I just, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, it's not, you know, and you know, I do see people sometimes and, but yeah, I, I miss, I miss the live stuff. But like you said, I, I have a subscriber who said, oh, you should keep doing this. Even when the theaters are about open again, you have to keep doing this. And he's like, I don't want to come from the East Bay all the time. Sometimes I just want to sit at home, you know? And it's like, wow. Are we going to have to Zoom every production? I don't know. If that's what people want. And for how long? It's like, we're going to be the last to get opened. You know, right. the restaurants will go, it's going to yeah. be, theaters will be the last. Okay, right. we have a question here from Laura. Given the challenges, how do, does John, how do you prepare, get the energy, energy psychologically for a Zoom play? Because we saw you talking to the audience, but you didn't hear anything back. But how do you get it? Uh, I run it on my own a lot. 
And, uh, you know, I just run it and run it and run it. So I feel like I could keep going. And it's weird. I get energy from an audience <laughs> on Zoom. I get energy. I don't know why. I could see some people moving around in a little box up here on the left. I was like, wow. But, you know, I just, when that little green light is on, I feel like there's an audience. And my energy goes like double suddenly. I eat a lot of protein. I eat tons of protein. And I work out in my hallway. I have like an exercise bike and I do sit-ups and stuff, but uh, it's mostly the audience. And it's weird. I would never have thought that was possible. I would have thought, I can't get my audience up for my energy up for, you know, but when I see a little green light and Stephanie says, you're on, I'm like, I am, I'm on. So the yeah. audience gives me energy. And the thing we're finding is, is it was very emotional. We're just listening to these horrifying disasters and we feel it. I mean, that was the big question. Would you feel the audience feel anything emotionally? And what we're finding is it's an emotional experience. It's a surprisingly emotional experience in this little box with this yeah. kind of strange thing and that, it, that the live stuff is just really important right now. Yes, absolutely. And, and I, oh, I was supposed to do a pitch for the tip jar. You want to do it now? Give the pitch. Yeah, yeah. Give to the tip jar. The Marsh is a glorious organization giving opportunities to people like me all over the place. The Marsh is goes all the time. This is so Marsh, you're going seven days a week. So please give to the Marsh, give to the tip jar and support the Marsh in this incredible program. I can't believe everything they're doing. So go Marsh, please support the theater. Thank you. And we're, we're at time. Can you imagine? We're at time. <laughs> Great. And become a member. Ryan will come and, and we are archiving all these shows. And if you let us, these shows will be archived. One of the questions are, do you, are you archiving the Rhino shows anywhere? Yes, they're all on our website, the rhino.org. Um, and we've got probably, I think we're getting close to 20 COVID-19 shows at this point. You can go to the rhino.org and watch, watch our stuff. Yeah. And, and we're archiving all our shows too. So you can see the bingo games. You can see the solo arts heal about health. You can see our solo spotlights. Next week, we have Ron Jones and Wayne Harris doing a thing about voting and getting out the vote. Uh, yeah. Performances, stories, which is so important now. So go to our website, go to the Rhino website, support us with tips and membership. We need you. We thank you for coming to our solo spotlight tonight. It's wonderful. Have a great week. Stay healthy and be in good spirits. Thank you all so much. Yay, thanks for being here. You're a great audience. Woo!